Two great revolutions rocked Central Europe in the 1520s. The first was the massive peasant rebellion, which sought a radical egalitarian realignment of society along really truly radical reformist lines, a kind of theological anarchism led by Thomas Munzer. In mid-May of 1525 would see the Battle of Frankenhausen and the defeat, torture, and execution of revolutionary Munzer and a staggering defeat of over 7,000 peasants. When your strategy is God will save us, stay home. Not long after, on the 23rd of June 1527 at the University of Basel, the renegade physician alchemist Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim would publicly burn the most important book of academic medicine, Avicenna's Canon of Medicine. In the years to come, he would come to revolutionize medicine, alchemy, and magic, gaining a new name, a name known to most of us, Paracelsus. And it would be in the crucible of his time at Basel, struggling against stolid orthodoxy, that would transform him from a renegade to a revolutionary, rejecting thousands of years of physical theories, medical theory, and practice, and even religious convention. Yet, Paracelsus remains far more celebrated than he's actually known. His enormous body of works is notoriously difficult. It's obscure with great sections still awaiting proper modern editions, and it even being unclear in many cases which works even genuinely flowed from his pens, which books are actually written by Paracelsus. He would give rise to a generation of doctors, alchemists, and occultists that would greatly accelerate the downfall of Aristotelian science, the humoral theory of medicine, and the mercury-sulfur theory of the metals and alchemy. And yet, and yet, despite his importance in intellectual, scientific, and religious history, his central works very often simply go unstudied, unread. But Given this problem, where should you start in your study of Paracelsus, a study necessary, necessary for any substantial appreciation of Western esotericism? That's what we'll explore today. And if you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, I hope you'll subscribe here to Esoterica and check out my content on other topics in esotericism, including curated playlists on things like alchemy. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for, for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work over at Patreon with a one-time donation via PayPal. You can use the Super Thanks option below the video, or you can pick up some of our cool black metal style esoteric-y merch, because black metal and esotericism go together like peanut butter and chocolate. Unless you have a peanut butter allergy. But now... To the foundational works of Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, the revolutionary better known to us all, and better known to history as Paracelsus. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, getting a real grasp on Paracelsus and Paracelsianism just doesn't happen until you actually get into his writings, and that's where the problem starts. Separating genuine documents from Apocrypha requires specialist knowledge. For instance, I imagine some of you have A.E. Waits, the Hermetic and Alchemical Writings of Paracelsus, on your shelf, because it's the one that's the most accessible. Well, it fails to do this rather badly, and in fact, it includes many spurious works, often those with more of an occulty flair, probably for that reason, because it was, you know, A.E. weight. And many of these works just don't accurately represent the thought of Paracelsus in any substantial respect. Further, he was also translating from the less reliable Latin translations of Paracelsus' work, putting us at one remove from English to Latin, then Latin back to, well, 
Paracelsus is admitted difficult German. It's filled with neologisms, ambiguities, and specifically folk knowledge that, well, that kind of stuff makes Paracelsus Paracelsus. Now, this work is widely available in reprints, but its unreliability and accessibility actually just double down the problem. It makes the situation worse because everyone has it, and yet it's not reliable. Secondly, even with a good sense of what Paracelsus actually wrote, which scholars still disagree about, frankly, there is just a mountain of literature he composed. Paracelsus was second only to Martin Luther. Yes, Martin Luther, in terms of 16th century German language literary output. He composed a a small library of works, ranging from a single leaf or a paragraph fragment to whole volumes spanning multiple books. In fact, wait to the end of the episode, I'll give you a sense of this. Further, because many of these were not published in his lifetime and they circulated primarily in manuscript form, it's often difficult to get a solid chronological sense of when a given work was composed. That's really important because Paracelsus, like many systematic thinkers, well, he built upon his thinking over time, and the chronology of the production in his intellectual life is also key to understanding the inner logic of Paracelsus' own intellectual, religious, alchemical, and magical development. Further is just the sheer difficulty of his works. Aside from his repetitious, cantankerous style, which is often as about as humorous as it is, frankly, tedious, the same can be said for the works of Martin Luther, by the way, the texts just assume a wide range of learning. After all, their target audience were the doctors of the day, which had a high degree of specialized knowledge from everything to religion and alchemy to folk and humoral medicine, the ins and outs of Aristotelian scholarship like scholasticism, etc. And if you're just not up to snuff on the cutting edge of mid 16th century religion, philosophy, alchemy, magic, etc., Paracelsus' writing are just difficult, even when they're clear, which is, you know, rare. They're just profoundly dense. And, of course, Paracelsus happily coins new phrases and words without ever really explaining them, at least not where he coins them. He uses terms in incredibly ambiguous and often just straightforwardly equivocal manners. He uses old terms in ways that are radically new and new terms that are old. He intersperses his own theories and speculations and various practices alongside with heterodox positions and orthodox positions, and frankly just drops random theoretical and practical bombs randomly throughout his works. It's a minefield of radical innovation and him lambasting orthodox academic positions that he despises all compose in his peculiar dialect of German, which can be obscure, frankly, even to specialists today. It's not even clear sometimes how he's using certain words, even though it's just written in German. Oh, and even the modern German edition is still incomplete. His theological works are only about halfway done, much less a reliable translation into English. So, studying Paracelsus in any language, especially English, is just extremely challenging, despite the fact that he is one of the most important figures, not only in the history of science, but also decisive. He's a top 10 figure in the history of Western esotericism. He's decisive in this field. And again, this just goes to show how much work remains to be done in this field if you want to do it to make even fundamentally important primary sources accessible in the first place. But thanks to the work of wonderful scholars like Andrew Weeks, one of the most fundamental starting points for studying Paracelsus is finally available in a reliable English edition. More on that later, good news and bad news there. And as I mentioned earlier, the real crucible for Paracelsus' assault would be his time in Basel. This is the period of his academic sparring and his eventual expulsion from the university post that he had there between 1526 and 1528. That's also when he got banned from the medical practices by the authorities at Nuremberg around 1529, and his being basically forbidden to criticize the current treatments for syphilis, or a disease that's very similar to modern syphilis now, that would lead to his completion of the dual foundational works, the 
core, really, of early Paracelsianism, the para works, the paragranum and the paramirum, literally beyond the grain and beyond wonder or beyond miracle. Of course, it was beyond a miracle because Paracelsus was a pathological narcissist. Those are competed around 1531, a year which also, by the way, saw the reappearance of Halley's Comet, so that was a sign. But some context. As I mentioned in the introduction, this was just a general period of revolution, and Paracelsus really fits right into it. He's really, in some sense, the rule and not the exception. I mean, these are the days of Luther's reform, Munzer's theological revolution to bring radical social equality, to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, and a great jolt, as he had it. This was a time period of the appearance of new incurable diseases, such as syphilis in Europe, Agricola's suggestion of combining alchemy and medicine for one of the most early systematic times, although back in the Middle Ages they had thought about this, brand new herbals and anatomical works, which frankly questioned the orthodoxy of the Galenic humoral medicine that was dominant at the time in the academies, the publication of efficacious folk remedies and local herbal wisdom, all of which were updating classical literature. Of course, Paracelsus was well aware of all of this, and he participated in these shifts around him. He was himself a Lutheran. In fact, during his lifetime in the Paragranum, he was actually referred to as the Luther of medicine, though he would always comment, I'll leave Luther to his reform and you should leave me to mine. I mean, he also supported insurgent miners during the peasant rebellions and even first documented illnesses specific to them. Illnesses not to be found in works like the works of Galen or Avicenna. He roamed around Europe as an itinerant field surgeon learning from regional folk cures and indigenous folk practices, and he favored learning directly from observation in nature than academic textbooks. He preferred folk wisdom in many cases to academic textbooks, and frankly, for good, for good reason. I mean, you read Plenty of the Younger, that stuff is nonsense. Now, before we paint him as a kind of proletarian medical revolutionary, which kind of was, he was also just as often motivated by his own tremendous ego his own ego, his complete inability to debate rationally, and his tendency to just spew invective whenever he disagreed with someone. Honestly, his repetitive and frankly childish narcissism often makes his early works, all of his works, difficult to appreciate at times. But for me, as an appreciator of some fine shade throwing, these are some real gems in these works. Like the authority that Basil apparently took to calling him cacophractus, talking poop. Cacophractus, as opposed to his actual name, which was Theophrastus, divinely speaking. And of course, you know, being not eight years old, Paracelsus counters that he will become the monarch of all medicine. He will be known to be the monarch of alchemy, and that all of their Aristotles and Rises and Avicenna, etc., they themselves are poop. And not just poop, but poop from the devil's butt. Devil poop. They are devil poop. Ye these were grown men, grown men academics arguing about what kind of poop their opponents were, the origin, the etiology of the poop, into the poop here. I'd love to restage some of these sections with like child actors in medieval clothes with giant books, alchemical equipment, each of, each of them calling something poopy McPoop face. You're poopy McPook alchemist. This is the kind of discourse that you find in Paracelsus's work, but that's all this poop tossing business is actually instructive. It's a weird sentence. Because it was during Paracelsus' time at Basel and then his censorship at Nuremberg and Leipzig that provided him with the escape velocity to become the curmudgeon, revolutionary, alchemist, magician, physician that we all know and love. It's like the Oscar the Grouch of alchemy. In Basel, Paracelsus was notorious for lecturing in German and not Latin and for disregarding, even publicly disparaging, the accepted orthodox medical theories and practices of his time. I mean, this would ultimately culminate in that public book burning of the canon of medicine mentioned earlier. Don't burn books. Even in protests, just don't burn books. And he was just known to be absolutely, completely disagreeable in the narcissistic extreme. I mean, the guy was just insufferable. Being a genius doesn't make you a good person. It just makes you a genius. After being expelled from his university position, he would come to Nuremberg, where his reputation preceded him. They wanted nothing to do with this 
problem, and he was forbidden to practice medicine there at Nuremberg. Further, he also attempted to publish a work on syphilis, which lambasted the current theories and practices for treating the disease, especially the use of guaiac wood. Now, the importation of that guaiac wood was actually held in virtual monopoly by the House of Fugger of Augsburg, which apparently pressured the medical faculty of Leipzig into forbidding Paracelsus from publishing his critiques, his two books which openly criticized this treatment, as, as nonsense. And it was nonsense, although uh, Paracelsus's reason for thinking it's nonsense are not quite right, but he was, he was correct for the wrong reasons. Now, between his expulsion from the faculty of Basel, his being forbidden to practice medicine at Nuremberg, and being straight up censored by, like, medieval aristocratic big pharma, medieval aristocratic big pharma, the renegade Theophrastus was transformed into the revolutionary Paracelsus. And it was in this crucible period of around 1526 to 1531 that he composed the two para works, the Paragranum and the Paramium, that best represent the fundamental shifts in his medical, alchemical, philosophical, religious, and even his own magical thought and that would become and eventually fused together to form what we now think of as the foundations and expressions of the philosophy of Paracelsianism. Now, this episode is not going to be a general introduction to Paracelsus's life. You can go read one of the great biographies by Moran or just the Wikipedia article or an overall episode on the thought or the vicissitudes of what became known as Paracelsianism. In fact, we're only going to be going over one of the early para books, specifically his Paragranum, in this episode, his more programmatic text. Though I am going to come back and do an episode on the very fascinating Paramirum, and then a more overall episode on the major elements of Paracelsus's more mature thought, and eventually an episode on what would become Paracelsianism, and an ism which is frankly notoriously difficult to pin down, because at some level, it was just as much an attitude as it was a specific set of doctrines and practices. In fact, I kind of think of Paracelsianism as something like punk. It was a way of being, an attitude toward authority, more, than, more often about what it rejected than anything that it actually believed in, and all doing it with a kind of gruff against the world, maybe even a little bit of a mean streak. Yeah. Paracelsianism was 17th century punk. Alchemical and medical punk, I stand by that. I'm going to die on that hill. It was punk. But again, topics for another day. But before turning to Paracelsianism punk, I think it's best to get grounded in the actual authentic text of Paracelsus himself, in which the fundamental elements of his revolution are first systematically, well, put to writing. The Paragranum simultaneously represents his rejection of the medical orthodoxy of the day and the new foundational pillars upon which he will seek to build a radically, revolutionarily new medical practice. The Paramium builds out his theory in practice and in a range of fields from alchemy, the natural and supernatural etiologies of disease, some theories of curation, arguments against the humoral theory, because he's going to reject that old theory of Galen, specific issues around women's medicine, which he thought to be radically distinct from men's medicine, and finally the use of magic. Of course, the use of magic in medicine along with much else and plenty of invective spewing along the way, because Paracelsus. Now, in this episode, let's tackle the Paragranum and the deep theoretical shifts that really do make Paracelsus a revolutionary. The Paragranum, again, composed around 1531, is a dual-purpose text which seeks to attack the foundations of the Galenic Avicenna humoral medicine and the inheritance of Aristotelian philosophy via scholasticism, both in content and in method, that is to say, the old scholastic appeal to authority as the fundamental grounds for truth. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details of humoral medicine, but the basic notion is, well, you probably know it. There are four Aristotelian elements, earth, air, fire, water, which give rise to fluids in your body, blood, phlegm, yellow, and black bile, which when balanced make for a healthy body. And when not balanced, when out of balance, well, they create illness. What one ingested in terms of food or sometimes even air or local environment would produce various amounts of these humors in the body, 
Thus, much of the medical practice of humoral medicine was things like regulating diet, observing excretions, and then inducing excretion, such as the use of bloodletting, diuretics, emetics, laxatives, etc., in the hopes of rebalancing the humors. Eventually, humoral medicine would come under attack from, surprise, surprise, Paracelsian yatrochemists, especially those over in France, who would form the modern foundations of something like modern pharmacology. But also, they would come under sustained attack by a more, frankly, empirically successful version of that assault at the level of autopsy and physical pathology. Actually, digging around in the body following things like dissections and even vivisections of folks like Versalius where they would look around the body to see if they could find this stuff and they never found the black bile. Ugh. The findings of all this which contradicted material found in the Galenic Avicennian canon. Paracelsus's rejection of humoral medicine is more an expression of the larger ad fontes, back to the sources movement of the Renaissance and less empirically grounded. But unlike those who sought to return to the more ancient Greek and Roman, or even go in real old school, Egyptian texts like the Hermetica sources of authentic wisdom, Paracelsus actually talked to, uh, sought to take medicine back to its true foundations, back to the true source of what we know about medicine, to nature itself, back to nature. For him, the actual workings of nature from disease to cure had been obscured by centuries of accretions no longer borne out by direct observation or experiment, but just out of slavish dedications to textbooks and appeals to authority, that's the scholastic part of all this, which were apparently incapable of diagnosing new diseases such as he had personally observed among the miners or the new syphilis disease that was rampaging through Europe in which no humoral theory or treatment could describe the etiology of, nor obviously could cure. Thus, the paragranum rejects humoral medicine. It doesn't reform it, it just rejects it. And he wants to clear the slate for a radical ad fontes return to academically unmediated nature on four distinct principles, or pillars. Philosophy, astronomy, alchemy, and virtue. For Paracelsus, nature is the embodiment of truth itself as a divine creative expression. Thus, philosophy can only just be learning the laws and modes by which this creative divine expression moves and flows and changes and shifts and arises and vanishes. Thus, observation of what is most apparent, but also what is most hidden in nature, the mysteria or arcana as Paracelsus has it, that's just philosophy as he understands it. Indeed, core to Paracelsus' conception of nature is a, a fractal-like nesting of every part within every other part, such that the macrocosm and the microcosm of the divine and nature are fully enmeshed with one another. This is starkly different than the Aristotelian philosophy or even the other occult philosophers of this period, such as Agrippa, that understood that reality was a kind of great hierarchical chain of being, which one could climb using philosophy, mathematics, and magic to get up to the divine for union with the divine. For Paracelsus, bearing a more radical hermetic influence above and below radically contained one another, and the human was the nexus of this admixture, thus disease and cure won't be about balancing humors within the body, but by placing the human being in the correct harmony with the spiritual and divine macroversal level with the natural and physical microversal relation. Because of this, he just rejects treatments by contraries, a dominant idea on the humoralists. That is to say, you treat something by its opposition. If something's too cold, you warm it up. But rather, he treats things by similarities, like begets like. Again, nature is an expression of the divine for Paracelsus. It's literally signed and sealed with hints, or arcana, as he has it, of how plants and animals and minerals are all bound together into one vast web of cosmic sympathy fractalated inside of each other, and thus treatment according to that is precisely a sympathetic harmony is the philosophical foundation for Paracelsian medicine and the shift away from humoral medicine. It's about realigning that fractalized integration of the macrocosmic and the microcosmic.
Now, as philosophy deals primarily with terrestrial creative divine expression, the natural physical world as we perceive it with our senses, it is also key for Paracelsus that one must grasp a divine expression in the celestial realm as well. Unlike the terrestrial world of direct visible causation, the celestial world is one of invisible, often arcane causation. The airy and fiery astral forces are the active male impetus, which when combined with the material, earthly, and watery elemental aspects of reality, come together to produce, well, most of the world around us, with the exception of the spiritual world, which we'll get to in the next episode. Thus, the astra manifests the active part of creation and transformation, which, by the way, this whole active, passive, male-female stuff shows that Paracelsus hasn't really broken that much with Aristotle. Just saying. But these forces are often invisible and arcane, the astral forces. So, unlike the purely empirical Galenic medicine, Paracelsus will develop a central role for the imagination. For the imagination as an organ of perception, precisely to perceive these more arcane and occult forces in his theory of medicine. Indeed, the human emerges from a now imperceptible substrate known as the macrocosmic limbus, a kind of materia prima out of which arise the three ultima, the trio ultima, the sulfur, salt, and mercury, which give rise in turn to the four Aristotelian elements. Notice the four Aristotelian elements are not fundamental in his system which are then turn and they flow back into an imperceptible microcosmic matrix, a womb, the mother within the mother, as Paracelsus have it, again from which human beings flow out. That is to say, from limbus to matrix, it's a flow from microcosm to macrocosm, then back again. Again, this fractal nesting of above and below reveals not a hierarchy of male, female, or limbix matrix, but that these are dialectical inversions of one another. Of course, with this hermetic principle, one must study the divine heavens because those heavens are precisely the human being, and thus to treat people, one must employ the vast array of arcana known from the influences and powers and radiations of the celestial movements of the heavens above, perceived primarily, of course, again, by the imagination. Astronomy, then, is celestial philosophy. Philosophy, then, is terrestrial astronomy. Above and below are one nested totality, with the human being that expression of the divine contemplating itself, harmonizing and balancing in its place. Thus, the recognition of physical and celestial reality is self-recognition, and self-recognition as curing itself through that harmonizing reality is self-recognition as the restorative power of the divine, the divine within and as us, specifically the doctor seeking to cure those in radical disharmony or dis-ease. Also, you can see why Hegel really liked Paracelsus. It just feels some of like a proto-version of the phenomenology of spirit. Of course, the world around us is not generated in a state of perfection. Just look around, Paracelsus agreed. And like other occult philosophers of his time, from Ficino, Agrippa, Reuchlin, John Dee, Paracelsus was a devout Christian. And in his case, he was a deeply, deeply in agreement with Luther's reform movement. He was a Lutheran through and through. Indeed, as much as he was a maverick in so many other fields, his theological works remain sometimes shockingly orthodox. So, with his own, you know, Paracelsian streak in there. However, the world is a world of disharmony, a world in rebellion to the divine grace of God, and thus a world ultimately in need of being made perfect, of being perfected through the saving power of Christ, but also through the power of human art, of human artifice, specifically the art of alchemy, the third pillar of Paracelsus's revolution. Alchemy for him is simply that art by which we refine nature, perfecting an otherwise fallen world to reveal the mysteries and arcana of God's divine signatures, secrets that the goodness of God has left actually imprinted all around us, but are hidden and covered over by corruption and sin. The task of the alchemist is to place nature into the archaeus, the kind of primeval firmus or athanor, and using divine fire, even the divine fire in your belly, 
the meeting point of earthly and the celestial to purify and redeem nature, thus restoring it to its original glory and perfection. Thus the alchemist is the agent of God upon the earth and within the earth. Just as Christ transmuted and redeems the fallen soul, so too does the alchemist redeem the disharmony of the world through that alchemical process of purification. Of course, this process will reveal all manner of divine marvels hidden in nature because of sin, and those marvels and arcana will, because of the divine origins of the divine goodness expressed and hidden in nature all around us, they will lead to even miraculous curative powers. Thus in Paracelsus there is a keen interest in alchemy, but his spigerics, as he terms it, has more to do with extracting medical power from nature in the form of the arcana than transmuting base metals into gold. Though he does think that transmutation is possible and even laudable. He does think that it is something that alchemists should do. However, medicine and not metallic transformation should be the ultimate goal of the alchemist. The restoration of the human being and nature more generally. Gold is great, but we're the nexus of all reality, y'all. Curing us is so much more important than curing lead. And this is a decisively important step in both the history of alchemy and the history of medicine. Prior to Paracelsus, there was a vague sense that the Philosopher's Stone could cure illness and prolong life. But the specifically medical direction in alchemy never truly came into focus. It got mentioned here and there, but mostly as, a, as an alchemical afterthought. And ditto, when medical doctors and apothecaries and barber surgeons came to use chemical compounds, there were always tension between these practices, with academic Galenists looking down their nose at the apothecaries as basically quacks, and barber surgeons as little better than butchers. Paracelsus just cuts this Gordian's knot. Alchemy must be made to serve medicine, and the boundary between doctor apothecary and barber surgeon has to just be shattered. Though Paracelsus does maintain some degree of invective for the four barber surgeons of the time, who I have a ton of respect for. I mean, they're the people that like pulled your teeth and amputated gangrene. But it's from this theoretical unification of alchemy and medicine as a forefront issue in Paracelsianism in the form of spigerics that gives birth to the field of iatrochemistry, or the full combination of alchemy and medicine, a shift that would eventually lead us to modern pharmacology, to modern toxicology, and to modern psychiatry. That's how revolutionary Paracelsus' shift is in the Paragranum. The final pillar following philosophy, astronomy, and alchemy is proprietas, or virtue, though it's much wider in scope than just moral virtue, though, of course, you have to be morally virtuous despite the fact you keep calling people devil poop. Here, Paracelsus is his most bold, that's saying something, by linking the above and the below in the strongest possible terms. Theology. Just as the divine Christ tinges and redeems the soul through grace and faith, so too does the doctor, does the physician cure the human being physically. The physician comes to take the place, in a sense, of the priest who becomes redundant in this Lutheran Paracelsian logic. Faith alone is sufficient for salvation. Good old-fashioned Lutheranism, it, he's a, it's the idea of Christ treating the soul, and the doctor sets about harmonizing the human being, the physical human being, in the macro-microcosm for Paracelsus. Yes, just as the true church was in need of reformation from the priest Pharisees with their saints and sacramental superstitions, so to the physician Pharisees with their scholastic nonsense and superstitions parading as medicine. Though, I'm not super down with all this hating on the Pharisees. Frankly, Luther and Paracels didn't know the damn thing about the Pharisees. And just as Christ had to die and be buried in the earth, so too does medicine need to die as it existed in Paracelsus' time in order to be reborn with the true physician emerging forth with all power over both life and death. Indeed, by plunging into darkness, sin, and death, the Paracelsian doctor will emerge even being able to use powers typically reserved for Satan, for Satan to righteously cure people. 
This is the transformation of what was once condemned sorcery, along with so many mysteries and arcana, will be redeemed by nature via alchemy and Paracelsian medicine more generally. In fact, one of the more famed of these arcana is the Mumia, the mummified life force in human corpses, which can be used to bestow arcane healing powers. Yep, arcane medicine made from mummified human corpses. This is a whole thing back in the day. It's now referred to as medical cannibalism. Medical cannibalism is going to have to be a future episode. This Mamiya mummy business. Thus, even vile necromancy is somehow redeemed in the Paracelsian project. With knowledge of the heavens and the earth, their perfection through alchemy, exoteric knowledge of nature, and an esoteric wisdom of the mysteries and arcana, along with the moral desire to act in unison with the divine, the Paracelsian physician takes on positively apocalyptic proportions. Just as Luther had paved the way for the final battle with the Antichrist through the restoration of the true church, Paracelsus himself seeks a full restoration of the human as the nexus of the universe, the whole universe, through the reformation of medicine as the culmination of philosophy, celestial knowledge, alchemy, and lore of the arcane and the mysterious. Thus, the Paracelsus of the Pyrogranum comes out like a wrecking ball, smashing everything in sight in one swing and then programmatically setting up a revolutionary agenda for the foundations of medicine, philosophy, science, religion, and even esotericism, even magic in the other. It's a work of true revolutionary scope and daring. However, it's virtually all programmatic and only vaguely hints at what any of this is going to look like in practice, or even as a morally fully fleshed out theory, it's easy to put humoral theory and Catholic superstition on blast. It's easy just to toss out things. It's a very different thing to systematically lay out your own theory and practice, and then actually show, show that your program works. For instance, by curing syphilis, which I really do suspect that Paracelsus wanted to be the paradigmatic example of how his medicine trumped the old humoral medicine. And that would be the big test case for this. It didn't cure syphilis. It would be in his second work of the period, the Paramirum, or Beyond Miracles, or Beyond Wonder, that would really form the keystone and jumping off point for the rest of Paracelsus's career, and frankly, for all later Paracelsian theory from the French yathrochemist over there developing our modern pharmacology to Paracelsian occultism that in many ways persists all the way down to this day. It would be this text, the Paramirum, that would more fully introduce us to his new physical theory of the Ultima Tria Prima theory of salt, sulfur, and mercury, which would supplant the older fourfold theory of nature and the mercury-sulfur theory of the metals. It would combine them in some sense. His doctrine of signatures and the treatment of like by like, the extraction of arcana from nature, the alchemical description of diseases and treatment, including his theory of the tartaric theory of disease, and the importance of bowel health as an alchemical procedure. Remember, as above, so below. That's your Athenor. It's in your belly. The inner world of women's health, including the powerful matrix or microcosmic womb within the womb responsible for human generation, along with the diagnosis and treatment of disease from the purely spiritual world including fighting fire with fire in this domain, the extremely controversial use of medical magic. All of this will be covered in the Pyramirum, and I'm going to be doing that in the next episode in this series as an introduction to Paracelsus, which I imagine is going to be at least four episodes long. Keep a lookout for all these episodes coming on Paracelsus. But as I mentioned earlier in the episode, the vast amount written by Paracelsus just pales in comparison to how little, how little is in reliable English translations. But for a brief biography, I would consult Moran's Paracelsus and Alchemical Life. Moran has written other wonderful alchemy uh, texts on alchemy as well, so those are all really worth looking at. Also, I have an alchemy reading list in the description if you want to check it out. Nicholas Goodricks Clark has also prepared a brief selection of texts by Paracelsus that are pretty reliable, and that is well worth checking out. He's a wonderful scholar. However, remember the A.E. Waite edition of the Hermetic and Alchemical Writings of Paracelsus? 
It just isn't reliable. You can have fun reading it, but you're not going to really learn much about Paracelsus from it. But the good news, and the bad news, is that a very reliable edition of the Pyogranum and the Paramirum by Andrew Weeks does exist, and it's been published by Brill. And it costs between $350 and $400. I know, I know. Them's pitchfork and torch prices. But that's just Brill for you, making us all want to riot. Books so expensive that uh, they might as well not even exist for the vast majority of people. So you probably need to ILL it, but it's interlibrary loan if you have that option at your local library. I mean, that's what I had to do. It's just that expensive. Though to give you some sense of the scale of Paracelsus's corpus, and especially the size of the Paragranum and the Paramirum, take a look at this. This is the translation and the edition by Weeks. So, I like big books and I cannot lie. <laughs> this is it. This is just the Paragranum and the Paramirum. This is a significant chunk of book. Thick. It runs to right at 950, nearly, ni nearly 950 pages, including a fantastic introduction by Weeks. This is a massive book and it only covers two books by Paracelsus, the Paragranum and the Paramirum. So, give you a sense of like, just how much I'm summarizing, right? We just did the Paragranum. We'll do the Paramirum next time. So this is an idea of what the week's text look like. 950 dense pages of Paracelsus. Now to be clear, this has the uh, early modern German and the English facing. So you get the, the German with translation notes and you get the English with great notes about sort of what in the hell Paracelsus is talking about over here on this side. So it's fantastic in this regard. This is a great, great, wonderful text. I'm not sure it's worth $400, but whatever. But if you want to get a sense of what this looks like compared to an edition, a historical edition of Paracelsus's books, ooh, I like big books and I cannot lie. This is an edition from 1616, giant volume in folio. This is the first volume of Paracelsus's complete works, although it's actually not complete. This is the first volume. The second volume is damn near impossible to find because it contains all the cool magical stuff because everyone wants cool magical stuff. But you can see here this volume, this edition here has a great frontispiece and you can see Paracelsus there at the top looking consternated as he is like to do. So at any rate, this edition is absolutely fantastic and it contains the Paragranum and the Paramirum. So if you want a sense of what we're looking at here, this is... I can show you. That is the Paragranum. This is just the Paragranum, right? It's really big. It's in the giant folio edition, so it takes up, you know, a hefty footprint, and the font is relatively small. But this is the Paragranum, right, right here. So it spans just about that much. That much. That's the original Paracelsian text in the German that great Fraktor font that makes it look so imposing. The Paramirum, just to get a sense of it, it's about three times as long, right? We'll be covering next time in our episodes on here at Esoterica on Paracelsus. This is the entire Paramirum. So we'll be covering it next time. We'll get all the cool magic stuff and all kinds of things about sulfur, sulfur salt, and mercury. So this is the Paramirum. Again, I'm trying to get this in the camera, but this damn thing is heavy. Ooh. At any rate, right? So here we go, right? Paragranum, and then Paragranum, the text we're dealing with today. Now you might be asking yourself, well, what in the world's all this? More Paracelsus. This is all just one volume of two of Paracelsus. There is a ton of stuff in here. And again, I need to give you this side of it. That's just kind of what we're dealing with. Paracelsus wrote an enormous amount. So when you take the weeks and the actual historical text, or one of the historical texts, this is two books of Paracelsus. This is dozens more in this giant folio edition. So I'm just giving you this sense of this to give you an impression about when I say that we're dealing with a tiny amount of Paracelsus, I hope you'll believe me. Ugh, that book's are heavy. I hope you'll believe me. It is an enormous amount of Paracelsus that we'll be covering. So when I get into Paracelsianism, 
What I'll have to do is I'll be scaling up from the paramirum of the paragranum to some other standard text and then taking all of that and trying to give you an overall theory of what Paracelsus believed and then jettisoning out into Paracelsianism more generally, which is just a mess of contradictory beliefs and practices. Again, it's kind of punk. And so to hammer down what punk is, good luck. It's like hammering down what Paracelsianism is. At any rate, that's the kind of world I live in. This great book of weeks, pick it up if you can, get it through ILL and read it. And I'll put a link down in the description to a historical edition of Paracelsus if you want to take a look at that. But more Paracelsus to come. we got at least three more episodes. It's going to be way more than that, but at least three more. So stick around for more Paracelsus. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge. Thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane and history, philosophy, and religion.